Thank you, Anya. Um, I'm going to give an unusual talk today. It's going to be abstract and theoretical. Nobody ever invites a theoretician to talk, but that's what I'm going to do today. Normally I do life stories, I do videotapes, and I love doing that sort of thing, but no stories, no pictures, all ideas today. So, the first time I spoke on what was going to become this theory was uh, 20-some years ago in Leicester. It was my first trip outside of the United States. Sorry, no stories. My first trip outside of the United States. And I didn't quite have a theory yet, but it was coming. And an older academician sitting in the audience because of the time lag, I doubt he's here today, said to me, well, what are the postulates? What do you have to believe before we can start listening to your theory? What's the unprovable ground that you stand upon? And I couldn't quite answer that day, but I obviously haven't forgotten the question. So, what are my postulates? Well, the first one, is that the brain is evolved to cope with danger, to identify and organize around danger. It seemed like a strong statement, but obvious, obvious. Why would a brain evolve to cope with safety? Even the stupid can handle safety. It's danger, which is the threat, and only the smart can deal with danger. So I thought the brain was evolved for danger. But now I have a citation. It's not a postulate. Then I thought that there were multiple models produced in the brain about what the danger might be and what one might do about it. But now parallel processing to produce multiple dispositional representations is the center of the cognitive information processing work. So that's not a postulate anymore. That's got all kinds of data. Then I thought that there was a relation between exposure to danger early in life and the probability of psychiatric disorder later in life. And I give you one very recent reference, um, just out a month or so ago. But there's now accumulating information, although I would have to say it's still fairly new in the psychiatric literature to ask, has the person with a diagnosed disorder been subjected to endangering experiences earlier in their life? The answer's coming in, in yes, surprise, surprise, but the causal link is not yet being discussed. And in this literature, what is popping up again and again is everybody's exposed to danger sooner or later, what really seems to hold the thing together is a maladaptive family process. And when you get that, then you start getting a cascade of dangers and psychiatric disorders. So I'm back onto my attachment ground around uh, maladaptive families. Was my base security? No. I don't think you have to have a model of security as the most desirable, the universal base for attachment. In fact, I think most humans, over most of our time as a species, have not been securely attached. I just said I don't think that it takes any particular astuteness skill, preparation, anything else to survive safety and security. Survival is about surviving danger, and all of us who are here are the outcome of generations of individuals in evolved species arriving at us today, where everyone, every organism preceding us, has survived the dangers of its lifespan. Four and a half million years, billion years worth. It's a lot of surviving of danger. I think 
the strength of our species is our variability of strategy in the face of danger, not our universal security in the face of danger. And if it were security, we'd be genetically hardwired for security, but we're not. So what is the dynamic maturational model, the DMM, of attachment and adaptation? It's a comprehensive theory about the effects of exposure to danger on psychological and behavioral functioning. It's a broad statement to make. The theories in the DMM brought by Bowlby were these, and the most important, if you want the slides, I'll give you an email address later where you can get them, just to save you a lot of writing, because I'm going to talk very fast. Um, what Bowlby contributed that I thought was most valuable and that I have taken away and used is the idea that you don't cancel out some theories that aren't as good as your theory. You take the best of the theories of your time, and since they are all about humans, you ask, how can they fit together? Because clearly, humans do fit together. So it's a, it's a model, the DMM is a model of integrating theories, not excluding theories. It's not competitive, it's integrative. Ainsworth, whom I studied under, brought the empirical evidence to support Bowlby's theory, and she, she gave us the three basic strategies that 11-month-old infants can use to keep themselves safe with different kinds of mothers. So these are the ABC patterns of attachment. After Bowlby and Ainsworth, these are some of the theories that have been integrated in in the last 20 to 30 years. And you see it ends with etc. cetera. Uh, it's not a complete list, but it gives you a notion. What we end up with is a biological, psychological, sociological model of adaptation. It moves from the level of genes and epigenetic functions to the biochemical and neuronal level to the interpersonal or intrapersonal process of managing information to the interpersonal context in which information is given meaning to the outer cultural, subcultural context in which meanings become adaptive or maladaptive. This is a theory of how we adapt all the way from genes to cultures in an interactive process. Within the dynamic maturational model of attachment and adaptation, there are two models. One is a developmental model of individual differences in adaptation and maladaptation, and the other is a treatment model for expanding any individual's adaptation. There's an implicit understanding that everybody is adapted to something, even the people coming to you with uh, diagnostic conditions are adapted to some context, but not the context in which they're living right now. They're maladapted in that context. And rather than taking away the maladaptation, you want to add to their range of adaptation so that they survive both in the context where they learned what isn't working now and in contexts like the present where they need other forms of adaptation. So just as I said with building on Bowlby's work, it's not a matter of taking something away. It's a matter of adding things on and making them specific to the context where they are the adaptive thing to do. Clinically, I think the DMM can reframe disorder as dysfunction 
around protection. One's organized strategy isn't functioning in the current context. So this is not a symptom-based model. We don't count the things that are wrong with you, check them off, and plop you in a diagnostic box. And it's not based on the idea of disorganization. Um, that was brought up in Anya's introduction. No, I don't. I believe in disorganization, but I don't think you find much of it, certainly not among your clients. And I think clinically, the DMM can reconceptualize causation of dysfunction in a um, systemic and accurately complex manner. I'm very frustrated reading the literature on causation because we still seem to want linear causation, single factor causes. I don't think that's going to account for the complexity of behavior that we see. And I think it can lead to personalized mental health treatment. And I know I'm in altogether the wrong country to be using a phrase like that. I know that you'd like to go with short-term manualized group treatments. I'm well aware of how things have been going here for the last decade or so. But that's not the direction I'm going, even though much of my theory has been developed coming in and out of your country and working here, oh, 60, 70 times over the last 20 years when I've developed this theory. So surely you've influenced me, but I haven't gone in the direction at least of policy. For those of you who know the ABCD model, let me give you a quick look at the problems with disorganization. It isn't theoretically coherent, and I have the citations here of people who have said this. Pick out Michael Rudder's name. That's the one you're going to know. And notice Robbie Dushinsky. He's the one you're going to know. Hot stuff, this young man. It's neurologically inaccurate regarding the function of fear on behavior. It accounts for too little variance in outcomes. 2% in a meta-analytic study and in a comparative study, DMM versus ABCD, ABCD picked up 5% of the variance, the DMM 19% of the variance. Substantial difference here. It fails to identify the function of behavior. Now that's what Ainsworth and I wrote back in 1989, a paper that has been forgotten. It treats behavior as meaning, a smile means, a touch means, rather than meaning being generated by the dyad. Your smile is hostile. I don't like that touch. It assumes that the past is more powerful than the present. It all started when you were 11 months old and you're on a trajectory that you can't get off after that. It doesn't explain what the mind is doing. If you're disorganized regarding security, did your mind fall asleep on you? What, what is happening when you're showing the behavior that is troublesome? I think the mind is always active and solving problems. It lacks clinical utility. Of what use is it to put all the people of interest into one category? I'd rather use DSM or ICD, which I don't like, than to put everybody into one category called unresolved, kind of classify or disorganized. And it overlooks the whole developmental process. It's as though everything stopped when you were 11 or 12 months old, and you're left with the categories of infancy, plus everything else being disorganized. I think life continues after 12 months. Let me just show you schematically. Ignoring the word disorganized, these are the Ainsworth's patterns, A's, B's, and C's. Ainsworth didn't put them in this arc model. I did, but these are her three patterns. According to Mary Main, if you don't fit in those, 
Then you are disorganized. All the remaining space of possibility is disorganized. The DMM, on the other hand, has these patterns for infancy, with AC being my dissertation, which was done under Mary Ainsworth, who, when I drew the first model, which was a circle, and had B, A, C, and then it had AC down here making a circle, she said, oh yes, I always knew A and C came together. Well, if you happen to have watched my publications, you've seen this circle change a number of times over 20 years. So now this is just the upper portion. In preschool age children, we add the first compulsive patterns, compulsive caregiving and compulsive compliance, and we add the first coercive patterns, coercively aggressive, coercively feigned helpless. In the school years, we add another pattern. In adolescence with the onset of sexuality, we add another pattern. And in adolescence, um, late adolescence and early adulthood, we add the really psychopathological uh, patterns. So you can see the difference in complexity. The ABCD model is not changing over this developmental range of time. The word for disorganized is changing. We're getting disorganized controlling, cannot classify, unresolved, but we're always getting a third catch category for everything not identified by the infant patterns. All right. So let me show you the developmental model, which is the DMM. Um, expanding Ainsworth's ideas of individual differences in attachment across the lifespan. Danger is normal and universal. What we now know is that about 60% of adolescents, all adolescents, not a subgroup of adolescents, 60% of all adolescents have already experienced a major danger in their life. So that's in like the first 15, 16 years of life. Something very threatening has happened in 60% of individuals' lives. When I teach the adult attachment interview course, I ask people to bring me three interviews as their practice, and I say, one of them, please, from somebody over 50, because nobody can live half a century in absolute safety and comfort. In half a century, everybody has been exposed to something awful, something we wouldn't want, something very threatening. And now you can see what the mind has learned to do to cope with that threat. Um, the dangers that are relevant are the dangers experienced by one's parents. You have no idea how many children coming to treatment have parents who were endangered, and the child's behavior reflects their reaction to the parent's accommodation to their danger. The child may not even know what the parent's danger was, but they're organizing around the parent's reaction to the danger. It's danger to oneself, both oneself in the past and oneself right now. Certainly the first question I would ask when somebody comes for evaluation is, what are the dangers right now? What could go wrong in your life right now that you have to protect yourself from? Because I can't make you psychologically healthy while you're still being exposed to this danger that you must protect yourself from. So I need to know about the current danger. And then as people get older, danger to their children. They organize around what they imagine, realistically or unrealistically, would be the danger to their children. The DMM proposes that behavior is organized in response to threat, that that's the first thing that our brain does. It says, what could kill me today? Let me organize around staying alive. 
And it's only after you've succeeded in doing that that other things become important. The organization is to protect the self, to enable one to se select and protect a reproductive partner, and to protect one's progeny until their reproductive maturity. So this is a theory about safety and sex. Look at the news, look at the movies, listen to the songs we sing. These are the two things we are absolutely focused on because if you don't get them right, you don't have a genetic future. I'm not going to talk very much about sexuality today. I'm talking as fast as I can already. Um, but sex is at least as important as safety because without sex, there is no future. The three aspects of attachment, the holy trinity of attachment, is a relationship with a protective person a strategy for eliciting protection and comfort from that protective person, and the information processing that underlies that strategic behavior. It's the information processing that Bowlby mentioned in one chapter in his third book of the um, trilogy, Attachment and Loss, that has become the basis of the DMM. I'm really interested in what is the brain doing to understand the context and the response I should give to it. Attachment is a life cycle theory. It crosses all of our important relationships across all of our life. It is relevant to the last moments of life when our survival is at risk and we will lose the battle. But when we talk about old people, I'm really into old people these days, when we talk about old people reverting to childhood, we are only saying they perceive, as do preschool age children, that the world around them is large and threatening and that they are vulnerable again in a way that they were not vulnerable in their 20s through 50s or so. And they change strategy to accommodate their changed vulnerability. They don't go backwards. They simply perceive that their relation to the context has changed. So talking about attachment as a protective strategy, there are three types. Type B is children, uh, people, people, who communicate their thoughts and feelings openly and clearly. They negotiate with other people, and they compromise on what we shall do. Surely that's the best strategy. But it's not the best strategy in some kinds of dangerous circumstances. In some kinds of dangerous circumstances, it would be unwise to let people know what you're going to do unwise to let them know how you feel, and not good to negotiate or compromise. Ask the Palestinians, ask the Israelis, do they feel safe with this strategy? Neither does. Type A is first a strategy of don't do the wrong thing. Then, after you've inhibited what you wanted to do that was wrong, do the right thing. Hide your negative feelings. With some powerful people, this is what you need to do to stay safe. Type C is stick to your feelings. Don't negotiate with anyone. Don't compromise. Don't delay gratification next year in five years when mummy comes back. No. Stick with what you want. Demand that you get it right now before waiting for anything else. And if you must, deceive. So here are how the strategies are displayed in infancy. Now in the preschool years, we add compulsive caregiving to vulnerable, depressed, neglectful parents, and compulsive compliance to angry, aggressive parents. And on the other side, uh, coercive aggressiveness to parents who are wishy-washy and they, well, and 
the child's aggressiveness pushes the undecided parent to do what the child wants. Or a faint helpless, oh, you got to take care of me because I can't, and that brings the bear. Both of those strategies can work with an indecisive, not always available parent. In the school years, we get the punitively obsessed with revenge pattern and the seductively obsessed with rescue pattern. These are the aggressive and feigned helpless patterns plus deception. The individual is now willing to use deception to get what they want from the environment, what they think they need from the environment. In the school years, you, or, uh, sorry, adolescence, you get compulsive self-reliance. This is A6. This is, this is the gift of England to its pioneer colonies. All of the pioneer colonies are typified by compulsive self-reliance as a dominant pattern. Australians, Canadians, Americans, we all just headed out into the wilderness by ourselves. We can do it, don't need help. Uh, don't need help, don't need people, do it by yourself. How the hell are you gonna have sex? <laughs> and it forces you into the compulsively promiscuous pattern, which socially is the acceptance, the welcoming of people you don't know. What self-respecting European would accept strangers? They don't, not for generations. Americans do. Have a smile, greet people don't know. And then there's sexual promiscuity. Delusional idealization is the loving of a dangerous figure, the hostage syndrome. Um, an externally assembled self is an iatrogenic pattern created by too many institutional or foster places so that you have no way to build a self with an attachment figure, and you take the bits and pieces that are given to you by the professionals and the people they've placed you with. That's ours. We create it. Doesn't happen naturally. Menacing and paranoid, you'll um, recognize. Let me, menacing and paranoid, think Hitler. C6, seductive, obsessed with rescue, think Princess Diana. She's your poster child. C5. Hmm. Remember Tony Blair? Yeah, probably do. Ah, but George Bush. Take George Bush, put him in C5, and then nudge him down toward that menacing and paranoid. You can't quite get the whole pattern, but you can get close. He's not a Hitler, but some of us were scared. Oh, Obama, one tear in four years, and such a good boy. Go put him over here, somewhere in the compulsive performing good boy category. Emotionally cool, thoughtful, right? So does that put a little flesh on these? An important thing to say is that we are describing the strategies that people use, not putting people in categories. When you assess attachment, you assess for a strategy, not for the person. A person can use more than one strategy. They can use different strategies at different times. We are putting strategies in categories, not people. And this version of the model just is meant to show you that there is movement, that it is dynamic, that the way you are with one person does not determine how you will be with other people, that the way you are today does not indicate how you were in the past nor how you will be in the future. It's not random, but you are not stuck. We are not classifying you, we're classifying the strategy you are using now. The empirical findings. Secure type B children grow up in safe and comforting contexts, and they have optimal child functioning, no surprise. Anxious types A and C 
grew up exposed to danger and lacking comfort, and they experienced developmental risk. Hundreds of studies to support this basic observation. Now, why do we assume that anxious attachment is bad? Danger is the problem. Danger is what produced the anxious attachment. That's what we need to take away. Anxious attachment is the solution. It's the child's strategy for eliciting protection and comfort from a not sufficiently protective and comforting parent. Anxious attachment is good. It protects children. It's their contribution to their own survival. It makes their parents better parents. Danger is what we want to get rid of. So let me switch to the information processing part of the model. Individual differences in the use of affect and cognition. All we have as information is sensory stimulation that reaches us through our sensory organs and it activates networks of firing neurons. Those networks are the representation of the relationship between self and context. We don't have internal working models on a shelf somewhere in our mind. We only have activated nets of neuron, networks of neurons. They are the representation. And when they aren't activated, the representation isn't active. It doesn't stay somewhere. And it creates a disposition to behave. Sensory stimulation creates responding in the body, and it varies in the intensity of the arousal. It creates temporal order in what happens, and this we'll call cognition. And there is an intensity of the stimulation from the outside, processed through the limbic system, that creates arousal. So we're getting organic arousal, um, cerebellar processing, sensory motor processing, and limbic system processing. Three different types of information that are organizing the mind. These create three predictions. Oh, oh, I feel I, I, feel I can't go on today. No, I can't give this talk. My stomach says, ah, Pat, you've given talks before. Forget the stomach, you know you'll do all right. Remember how it went in the past. Oh, beautiful room. I think I can calm down. Soft light. Don't need to worry about it. Three different ways of making a prediction about your ability to resolve the danger in the present. And you can integrate these and say, all right, well, I'll pay attention to the past in the room and just let my body go for 50 minutes. Information is transformed. When, when what, you, what you know truly predicts what will happen, when a clutched gut really means you're going to be stabbed to death in the minute, that's truly predictive. But when it only means you're worried about something that won't happen, then it's an erroneous prediction. It might be omitted from prediction. Forget about your belly, Pat. Don't even think about it. Omit it from your processing. Tone it down a little bit. Pretend it isn't so bad. Pump it up. Make it the center of what you think. Falsify it. Smile when what you want to do is kill them. Deny that it has any effect at all. You know it, but just deny it or create a delusion that things are different than they are and live in the delusion. So each of these is a transformation that allows us to make a prediction to organize our behavior. The information is about the future, not about the past. I want to talk about affective information because arousal, we've had 10, almost 20 years of thinking cognitively. 
time for affect, and if you look at the literature, this is one of the hot topics these days. And here's the basic arousal system, the way I would describe it. We're alert and comfortable is the state in which you can function. And then arousal goes up as you feel threatened, and it goes down as you become tired or there is nothing to interest you. At the highest point of unremitting pain, you die. At the lowest point of unremitting depressed low arousal, you die. After puberty, you get sex, thank heavens. But it does disrupt things, and it creates a second arousal system tied to particular parts of the body that arouse very rapidly. And we can now use the sexual arousal system to raise and lower our arousal. That's what masturbation does, right? You pump yourself up. You calm yourself down, and, and it interacts with basic arousal. Some people who are not comfortable with basic arousal use sexual arousal so that you get shifts directly across the model and diagonally across the model. It's particularly important if you work with people with sexual disorders to understand that it might not have anything to do with sex and everything to do with basic arousal that they cannot manage normally. Um, this just shows how arousal changes as a function of what's happening during your day, the changing set of threats and how arousal goes. Arousal is meant to keep us in tune with our context, alert when there is danger, quiet when there is not. So we end up with multiple dispositional representations that can organize our behavior. Some are pre-conscious. We don't even know we have them, but we act on them ever so quickly. Riding a bike is done pre-consciously. Then there are verbalized states in each of these somatic, cognitive, and affective models. Then there are integrative states. It takes longer in time to act on the representations that are verbal than the ones that are implicit. And it takes the longest in time to act on the integrative models. And if the danger is close or big, you don't have time. The people who come to you, who have often been endangered, don't have verbalizations for the danger, and they don't use integrative models because they wouldn't have lived through the event if they've sat around thinking while the danger was upon them. They are used to acting on the implicit models, and they simply haven't learned to use the other forms of information. So that allows us to take the behavioral model and now add the information processing model, and it becomes more and more complex until we get to adulthood. The power of the DMM is in the information processing that underlies the strategies. You don't want to just change behavior. You want to change how the mind produces behavior. So you need to know what information is being used and how is it being transformed, because that's what you want to change. You want to change what information the individual is aware of, what meanings they attribute to it, and how they integrate it to yield new behavior. Which strategy is best? Uh, each strategy is the best for some problem. None is the best for every problem. And to be safe by adulthood, we need to use them all. I don't think treatment is about taking away strategies. It is about adding strategies and tying them to specific contexts to know when and where to use the strategy. So this is a model for personalized mental health treatment 
a way to match treatment to individual differences in information processing. Why do we need a new theory? And don't we have enough? Well, I don't think our current theories of treatment are adequately developmental, empirical, systemic, or effective. Effective's the heavy one here. We have more than a thousand published treatments, and we need a way to choose which is the appropriate one to use for this person at this time. Which is best? I would argue just like theories, none is best. Each is the right solution to some interpersonal problem, and none is the right solution to every problem. You're going to need them all. Just like when you go to a physician, you don't want him to say, oh, I use Lilly products, or I use Merck products. You want him to be able to consider all the possible treatments and choose the one that is right for you. Only in mental health treatment are we wedded to cognitive treatment, to psychoanalytic treatment. I do this kind of treatment. It really doesn't matter what your disorder is. I do cognitive analytic. I do CBT. I do, huh? Would you go to a doctor who started with the treatment? I wouldn't. Treatment efficacy findings. 40% of people drop out of treatment before they begin. So anything that we know about findings is on just 60% of people who needed treatment. 65% of people in any kind of treatment, it doesn't matter, have a short-term benefit. Well, that's pretty good. Two-thirds of your people do better after treatment, and it doesn't matter which treatment you used. But 50% of people do better after being on the waiting list. Hmm. That's a 15% effectiveness. Are you happy with it? Is that what you were looking for? Of the 60% who stayed. And now that we're starting to look at the negative effects of treatment, we've always had to look at the negative effects of drugs, but we haven't looked for the negative effects of treatment. When we do, we're getting numbers that range from zero to the highest I've seen is 44% negative effects for some treatments. Ooh, that's a 50-50 kind of crapshoot. Do you really want to do that? I wouldn't. Um, so 10 to 20% are harmful. That's a washout, folks. If that number, this is stable. Many, many studies going into this. These data are new. They're not stable yet. We have too few studies. But if they're right, doesn't make any difference, does it? Oh. I look at that, and you know, in the United States, everything's insurance funded. We don't have a national health service. We can't get funded for more than three psychological, psychiatric treatment sessions at a time because we can't show that what we do will work. A physician can, and we can't. Until we get clearer efficacy findings, we're not going to get the money. We need to show, I would argue, that all of our treatments work for some subgroup that we need to identify, and we can't do that yet. We offer treatment based on our training. We need to be able to assess, to identify which treatments are appropriate for which people. Um, so I think we need to assess what the danger is, what the strategy that people are using to protect themselves is, and what information processing underlies that. So whether they are primarily somatic, cognitive, or affective, whether they use true, false, omitted, distorted, delusional, etc., and whether they work implicitly, explicitly, or integratively. And those three things are going to allow us to decide which set of treatments are likely to be useful and which set of treatments would be harmful. 
If you have someone who is organized affectively, you don't want to use a treatment that elicits affect. But if you have someone organized cognitively with inhibited affect, you want an affect eliciting treatment. Our treatment effects may wash out because maybe there are A's and C's mixed in the group and that the treatment is good for the A's, they need to reduce the inhibition, and bad for the C's who need to increase the inhibition. Maybe we have opposite structures inside our treatment groups, some of whom benefit, some of whom don't, and we get washout results. We need to formulate the central issue, which I want to frame in terms of what are you protecting yourself from? What's the danger in your mind? And then choose techniques that fit the information processing and the formulation and implement then a treatment strategy using those techniques and then assess the effect of that. Did it make things better? Did it not? And reformulate on feedback from our early use of the treatment. There are just a bunch of assessments that will work across the lifespan. I just wanted to show you that we have assessments that will give you this kind of information. Your formulation is going to be within a family, within a cultural context, not just a checklist of symptoms, oh, well, this is one disorder or another. It's going to be a functional explanation around why this person can't protect themselves or feel protected and why they are having reproductive problems. It is going to give us a relational understanding of dysfunction rather than an intrapersonal notion of disorder. So it replaces individual disorder with interpersonal adaptation to threat. It can create a bunch of novel hypotheses. We've talked about maltreatment in new ways, domestic violence, postnatal depression. For each of these, we've offered hypotheses about the adaptive organization of the individual that is no longer fitting their developmental context and how we can build on what they learned earlier to help them to understand what they're experiencing in the present and thereby change their behavior. So we're not talking about disorders anymore. We're talking about adaptive functions from the past that don't fit current contexts or challenges. So it's going to allow us to offer personalized mental health treatment that is organized around the history of exposure to danger of each individual person that we see and the self-protective strategy that they rely on most frequently and the transformations of information that they use to implement that strategy and the extent of psychological processing from implicit to explicit to integrative that they use before they act. And it's all going to be done through a personal, unique relationship with a therapist who functions as a transitional attachment figure, who functions as the mother or father this person needed to have but did not, helping them into the dangerous zone of the things they can't yet do by themselves and making it step by step possible to learn new ways to feel, to think, and to manage their body so that they can deal more adaptively with their current situation. So I think that attachment can affect treatment as information processing around current strategies um, by comparing types A and C, the extent of processing, the history of the problem, and the functional use of the therapist as a transitional attachment figure to highlight the current context. Your husband isn't your father. He's different. 
Did you notice the differences? Let's look at them. Um, to practice new behavior. You know when we try to do something new, we stutter and slip and stumble. You need to be able to practice in safety before you go home and make a mess of it. And to be able to reflect on the outcomes. Is this a better outcome than what you got when you did what you usually do? Do you like it? Do you want to try it again? No, you didn't like it. Should we try something else? And it allows us to use an array of treatments for each of these different levels has a kind of treatment associated with us. And when we formulate, we can think, do we need to be changing cultural issues? Do we need to do something at the genetic level? Do we need some drugs to change the biochemistry? It allows us to combine treatments to reduce the problem. Why do I think that the DMM has utility for you? It accepts all treatments as useful strategies for resolving some problem. We're not into throwing away out of choosing a favorite. Everything has some value. It treats dysfunction as an outdated attempt to stay safe when exposed to danger that now needs to be updated to the current context. It respects the strength that is needed to develop and diversify strategies for surviving danger. The people who came to you have had to have a great deal of strength to develop the distorted strategies they are using to stay safe. And it will take more strength to face those strategies and change them. It is empirically testable. And it highlights the power of therapists to use themselves to promote healing. Each of you can do that uniquely with each individual that you see. Takeaway points. Danger is universal. It elicits protective organization. Adaptation, even anxious adaptation to one's context is more important than security. Security is given to you. Strategies are earned. Our strength as a species is the flexible use of many strategies, not the rigid use of one strategy. Change is most effectively established in a transitional attachment relationship that works just where each person is ready to learn, ready to make the next step. So that I think personalized mental health treatment ties protection and information processing to the type of therapy that you will offer. And now we can start testing hypotheses about what works for whom. Um, we've discussed this in three books. The final one is not yet out. It's being written. If you want the slides, um, that's my email address. And you could write, and I would send you the slides. I understand that the first book is on sale here. They brought two copies. One is sold. <laughs> Thank you very much.